to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. City Club is where civic-minded people come together to make Portland and Oregon a better place for everyone to live, work, and play. I'm Courtney Nelson, City Club's president-elect. Members and guests are gathered here today at the Sentinel Hotel, along with all of you listening on OPB radio or watching on Portland Community Media. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners enables us to put on the state's best civic programs week after week. Our media partner is Oregon Business Magazine. Our current Friday Forum sponsors are AARP of Oregon, McKinley Irvin, Iberdrola Renewables, Airbnb, and Uber. Please join me in showing our appreciation for all of them. At ne next week's Friday Forum, former Metro President and current Executive Director of Transit Center, David Bragdon, will discuss urban transportation innovation. What can Portland learn from the rest of the country? Sarah Merck will facilitate the conversation. You can learn more about City Club events, purchase tickets, and become a member on our website, pdxcityclub.org. As always, we will be live tweeting today's program. You can follow along and join the conversation using the hashtag PDXCityClub. Later in today's program, Sandra McDonough will facilitate a Q&A session with those who are here in the Sentinel. Asking questions at the microphone is a benefit of City Club membership. But anyone here in the live audience at the Sentinel may write a question on one of the index cards found at the center of the table. Hold up the card and City Club staff will collect them before or during the Q&A session. And now for today's program. Elected to the U.S. Congress in 2008, Representative Kurt Schrader is currently serving his fourth term in the United States House of Representatives. He represents Oregon's fifth congressional district. Before being elected to Congress, a farmer and a veterinarian for more than 30 years, Schrader established and managed the Clackamas County Veterinary Clinic in Oregon City and operated his farm where he grew and sold organic fruits and vegetables. In the 114th Congress, Representative Schrader will serve on the Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Health and the Subcommittee on Environment and the Economy. Schrader is also the co-chair for administration for the Blue Dog Coalition and co-chair of the new Democrat Coalition's Healthcare Reform Task Force. Sandra McDonough has served as president and CEO of the Portland Business Alliance since August 2004. Before joining the Alliance, Sandra had a two-decade career in the energy industry, working for both San Francisco-based PG&E Corporation as well as Pacific Corp. Earlier, she was a reporter for 10 years with stints at the Oregonian and the Seattle Times. Please join me in welcoming Sandra McDonough and our representative, Kurt Schrader. my tools here together. Well, it's an honor to be here again. Uh, this is a, a great forum, a unique forum in Oregon, and frankly, we need more of these around the United States where folks get to interact uh, closely with their elected officials, important members of the community, and uh, a little give and take so we can actually get to understand uh, what's really going on at home and hopefully bring a lot of that back to Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm going to talk about probably the most scintillating and exciting topic in the world that I know you're all dying to hear about, uh, the federal budget. Uh, <clears throat> uh, arguably very boring. Uh, uh, I think I got on the Ways and Means Committee back in uh, the state legislature uh, just because I probably wasn't a very exciting guy and they figured, Kurt, you can do a little math, we'll put you over there. Uh, but uh, it's become very important, uh, not only at our uh, state level, uh, but I would argue respectfully, it is the most important issue that the United States Congress needs to get a handle on for the future of this country and for our kids. Unlike most states, uh, including Oregon, as you guys all know, the federal government doesn't have to have a balanced budget. And we've been very good at having an unbalanced budget. 
Debt is compounding uh, as we speak. Uh, we're all very familiar with some of the recent history. We know that the economy is not always going to be bailing us out, having just gone through the Great Recession. Uh, our national debt's been growing, and uh, even though the last few years uh, our annual deficit has gone down substantially uh, compared to when I first came to office, where it was a trillion dollars, uh, it's now merely in the $426 billion range, a drop in the bucket these days. Uh, but that's high. Uh, not only does it sound high to Oregonians, 74% uh, of uh, the GDP is a big number. It's an unsustainable number should we get into another recession. And as we all know, those of us with a few gray hairs, uh, that uh, that will happen again. Right now our economy is pretty good, but inevitably uh, that never lasts. Uh, these deficits we're talking about, they rival those coming out of the Great Depression and World War II. Uh, we have, over the last 60, 70 years, however, uh, had a moderation in our deficits up until about the Reagan era. Uh, they've been coming down. Uh, with uh, President Clinton in a Republican-controlled House, as many of us know and remember, we saw a few years of actual annual deficit, sur or excuse me, annual surpluses, not an annual deficit. That did not get rid of, however, the extreme debt we had been incurring. Uh, over this summer, uh, CBO has projected uh, current policies will still see annual deficits of 3 percent going up to about 6 percent. That doesn't sound so bad, but. By the year 2040 or so, we're going to have GDP, uh, or while our GDP will go up, the deficits will go up and nearly rival 100 percent of our economy. That's a big number. That's a big, big number. I, people say, well, how can this be? You know, we've been cutting budgets, uh, cutting our domestic and defense spending. Uh, the, that's at an all-time modern low uh, as a percentage of the, uh, the economy and the, the money we spend. Uh, it's a complicated. In 2011, uh, we passed the Budget Control Act uh, that included a, a facet called sequestration. Uh, many of us have learned to loathe that very term here in the great state of Oregon. Uh, we uh, affectionately refer to it as the nuclear option. Uh, it was meant to force us in Congress to deal with the entitlement and safety net programs that are in grave danger. We recognized we weren't governing very responsibly. And because we believe the mechanism had worked so well uh, in the previous century under Graham Rudman that uh, we would never let that happen again. And so we put that into law and encourage <clears throat> our colleagues to actually work on dealing with the bigger issues facing uh, our seniors and our children and grandchildren. But that did not happen, as you well know. Uh, sequestration means the budget, so for those of you that don't know, sequestration, sequestration means basically that the budget only increases minimally year to year with small caps that are put on, uh, not necessarily to keeping up with caseloads, inflation, national or nowadays international priorities. And if Congress fails to prioritize within that sequestration level, agencies are locked into virtually the same budget they had the year before with no ability, no discretion to move money around to deal with changing priorities. And of course, sequestration does virtually nothing to deal with the entitlement programs that are our long-term drivers of debt and deficit issues. Uh, the effect of all this is that our short-term deficits have dropped, like I alluded to. Unfortunately, that means we're cutting into education, health care, environment, natural resources, economic development, research, and veterans and military budgets. Uh, but the long-term debt picture continues to grow, particularly because there's this big tsunami of baby boomers that are now transitioning out of the workforce and into retirement. How did we get here? You know, what sort of malfeasance, what sort of horrible Machiavellian machinations did government do to get us into this, into this problem? Uh, I'd argue that it's a bigger issue than that. Uh, while we love to blame folks, uh, Congress has argued for years about budget priorities. Uh, unfortunately, the focus has always been on the annual spending that we do on defense and domestic. That's the annual appropriations bills, the 12 different separate bills that are supposed to make up the appropriations budget. And the differences weren't Democrat versus Republican. They were probably geographic in nature or philosophical in nature. The Southern Democrats would often side with Republicans on business issues, but with Democrats on labor and poverty issues. Even the, the Cold War was 
uh, dealt with, I think, in a bipartisan manner. And the concerns about Vietnam were, quite frankly, very bipartisan. The entitlement programs, Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, they weren't a big concern in that time. Uh, they were supported by lots of baby boomers that were working hard through the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and up through the 80s. And structurally, as I alluded to, they're never part of the annual debate in Congress. While they constitute about two-thirds of our federal budget, we never talk about them. They're on an annual self-sustaining, well, used to be self-sustaining revenue streams. But as I've talked about, there are now demographic shifts that are causing huge, huge problems. People are living a lot longer. Uh, the working population base to support the baby boomers in retirement has decreased dramatically. Medicare, established in 1965 with uh, payroll tax, yeah, that tax was going to be adequate to fund that program for the foreseeable future. Now, as you well know, we dip into income tax revenues to make sure Medicare beneficiaries get the benefits they need and deserve and have earned. The other thing that was going on all through this era of the late 20th century, and we had basically one party control in the United States Congress until 1994. There was not a lot of discussion or differentiation on priorities. But when the Republicans won a landslide victory under Newt Gingrich's banner in 1994, uh, the contract of America emerged. And Newt's philosophy was very different than what had been doing, we had been doing at that point. He was into over conflict, over issues and values. Right or wrong, he made a conscious effort to draw sharp demarcations between what he thought were the values of his party versus the other party. The budget became a battleground as parties became more polarized and that harsh rhetoric increased. Uh, Congress began to look more and more like a parliamentary system or it's a winner take all, depending on what party wins that particular election. Instead of uh, what we've done historically, where majority and minority parties work it out. Uh, consensus and compromise became dirty words. And we're living in that era right now. I'd argue one of the things that shocked me the most about going to the United States Congress is, although I thought, you know, I was a veterinarian with a family and some folks back east that I knew a little bit about what the great country of the United States was all about, I had no clue. This is a large, diverse, and very, very big country. And again, it doesn't fall along party lines all the time. It's about the geography and the cultures of various parts of this country. It should be a strength. It should be a strength. But it's now been turned into, unfortunately, a liability that we're dealing with the United States Congress. Uh, mounting budget concerns were obscured during the 90s. Uh, these, this didn't all of a sudden uh, that we have these problems with the entitlement programs. They were growing all along. But we had the dot-com bubble. Excuse me, dot-com bubble. We also had those uh, short period of annual uh, uh, budget surpluses. We thought we were all right. <coughs> and then, in, then some events happened that transformed uh, America's budget picture, 9-11, uh, 2001. Increased spending, trying to deal with the, the wars over the last 10, 15 years. The first big recession that didn't follow the normal recessionary trends in 2001, 2002, when I was co-chair of Ways and Means here. And then exacerbated, frankly, by uh, the so-called Bush tax cuts, when we thought we were fat, dumb, and happy at the end of the Clinton years. The Great Recession of 2008 drove a knife through the heart of the American business community and working men and women and their ability to keep their jobs and keep their homes. We continued spending on the war. Deficits grew to unprecedented levels and the baby boomers kept retiring. In an effort uh, to get our expenses and revenues in line, uh, shortly after I came to Congress, uh, the President Obama, at the behest of a bipartisan and bicameral group of legislators, uh, convened a work group, the so-called Bowl simpson Debt Commission. They began meeting early in 2010 and came up with some recommendations by the end of that year. The conclusion was that although, these, although the annual appropriations process comprising a third of the budget, dealing with, as I said, domestic and defense issues, was, was a big deal, 
the greater long-term threat came from entitlement programs and the inadequate revenue supporting them. A majority of the Commission actually agreed with that recommendation, but the way the legislation was written, if you didn't have a supermajority agree, recommendations were not brought to the Senate floor for a vote, and we never did vote. That was a real failure. The advent of the Tea Party and subsequent Democratic election battle uh, debacle in 2010, Congress tried to force itself to address the entitlement issues. I referenced the Budget Control Act of 2011. Uh, we actually did make a big down payment. No one knows that, but we put about $2.1 trillion in deficit reductions into effect uh, that are now over a 10-year period from 2012 through 2021. Uh, and we set these annual appropriations caps. The sequestration was set up, as I said, to hopefully get us to look at the entitlement programs, but it didn't happen. So at this point in time, we're in trouble. Without changes to the Social Security program and the Social Security Retirement Trust Fund, uh, it'll only be able to pay about three quarters of the scheduled benefits. That's about 750 bucks a month for most seniors in about 20 years. And the Social Security Disability Income Fund faces that same problem next year, 2016. Well, uh, by real bottom line is if we're not talking about the entitlement programs, we're kidding ourselves that we're doing something about the debt and deficit. I have good friends back in Washington, D.C. on the other side of the aisle, House Freedom Caucus and others that think they're doing the Lord's work, but they are not addressing the biggest cost drivers that we've got going for us. Uh, when I came to Congress in 2009, the, you know, frankly, the Appropriations Committee was a bipartisan committee, an island of bipartisanship as the partisan rhetoric increased. Unfortunately, uh, uh, with the loss of earmarks, I would say, I'm not a big earmark fan, but I will say with the loss of earmarks, uh, leadership's ability uh, to getting some of these appropriations bills through the process, severely limited, severely limited. The debt ceiling, which had been a non-controversial issue and it is act an outgrowth, if you will, of our budgeting, not a, not a cause in and, of, in and of itself, became a controversial issue. Shutting down the government became acceptable by a small minority that, uh, in Congress, and we saw that in 2013. So we continued, unfortunately, to flail around. Since 1996, uh, to give you a little perspective, Congress has failed to do the work necessary to pass our annual appropriations bills on time. And we have passed very few of them. We now operate under continuing resolutions or omnibus spending bills. The continuing resolutions, as you may know, are just temporary, theoretically, short stopgap measures that continue the funding uh, of your federal government on the same level as it was the year before. Uh, there's no ability to move funds around unless Congress gives that uh, directive or option to the various agencies. A very few times have we done that. We sometimes pass these big omnibus bills where we can't get all 12 of those appropriations bills through the Congress. Senate has done zero this year. I think the House has done four or five. So the, the favorite tactic is at the end of the year, leadership, not the committees, not the members, cobble together this big omnibus bill, maybe including some of the appropriations bills that have been passed. Uh, trying to figure out if there's enough, a, a way to get enough votes to send a, a bill to the president that he'll sign. Examples would be the Cromnibus bill and the Murray Ryan budget uh, just a couple of years ago. Currently, right now, where are we now? Well, currently, right now, we're under a very short term continuing resolution. Uh, runs till December 11th. Uh, this is an outgrowth of the Speaker of the House stepping down. He could not have done that if he was not resigning right now. He got a sympathy vote. He, got, he was able to reach out to Democrats, which he had not been able to do with great regularity in the past on budget issues, uh, and was able to get a bunch of Republicans to vote with him on the moderate side and outflank the so-called Freedom Caucus in Washington, D.C. That caucus had threatened to shut down the government over Planned Parenthood, as you've probably read. Uh, it's an important issue. Uh, both sides of the aisle feel very strongly about that. I saw that in my, my health uh, subcommittee. Uh, but it's no reason to shut down the United States government. Uh, where are we now? Uh, as you well know, we're speakerless uh, in the United States uh, Congress, uh, a place where we haven't ever been before. 
Uh, usually speakers come and go. Uh, I guess Danny Hastert was the longest serving one. Uh, and there, but there's, even as people go, sometimes through on purpose, sometimes because of some proclivities different members of Congress have that are not too savory, uh, there's usually a second person in line that acknowledges is going to step up. Well, when uh, Kevin McCarthy pulled out of the race for speaker minutes, literally minutes before he was supposed to walk into his caucus, uh, with a clear majority of the votes in his hands, uh, we were thrown into chaos. Uh, as many of you know, uh, folks are looking to Paul Ryan to be the savior, if you will, and Paul might be. He could be a huge, huge uh, positive benefit for the United States Congress. He's certainly smart enough, uh, but he is uh, strong in his personal ideology and philosophy, and that could be a problem. That could be a problem. And if I'm Paul Ryan, and Paul Ryan's very smart, and I know him, I, I served under him in, his, in the budget capacity, I'm wondering why the hell would I take that job and get my ass shot off a few months from now? I mean, he knows what he's up against. You're never going to satisfy these guys. Uh, although there are some aspects that I think we could, we could pull together. And we're facing some serious deadlines. The Export-Import Bank uh, is coming due. It's already expired over the summer. October, <coughs> excuse me, October 29th, the Highway and Transit Trust Fund expires. November 3rd, the debt ceiling needs to be erased, according to the Treasurer and Treasury. Uh, and as I said, uh, we run out of budget uh, options come December 11th. But to do any of that, we sort of need a speaker. We sort of need, need a speaker. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen uh, come next week. Uh, I am, along with others, in the United States Congress making a ton of phone calls, trying to reach out, in my case, to uh, actually to a variety of different aspects of the United States Congress, working hard with other moderate members of the House of Representatives, both on the Democrat and House side. And then I'm also, because of our budget crisis, reaching out to a bunch of members uh, that are very conservative, trying to establish what sort of revenues would be remotely possible to help us as we deal with serious structural reforms in these uh, safety net programs that we have going forward. I think, uh, I think we're in a real national crisis. Uh, I do hope that, uh, that we get our act together. I think that regardless of who the speaker is, believe it or not, I think a grander bargain on the budget that does the right thing, preserves uh, these safety net programs for our kids and grandkids who have no prospect, when you talk to them, have no prospect of getting Social Security or Medicare. I think we have an option of being able to do that. Uh, conservatives I've talked to are willing to deal with user fees. They're not big on new taxes, but user fees, the gas tax, you know, tobacco tax. There's all sorts. Of, I talked with Paul Ryan. He came to a committee meeting of ours. He talked about what he did with airline fees. You may not like these, but there are ways to put some revenues on the table uh, to help pay for these programs that we hold dear. And I, I, there's a bipartisan appetite for it. During the last shutdown, uh, I was pretty discouraged. And I pulled together a group of very conservative folks, some very liberal folks, and a few moderates like myself in between to see can we come up with a big deal, a big budget deal. And by consensus, we were able to put $1.6 to $2.4 trillion on the table. By consensus, with more money that you know, yeah, some people are more or less inclined on. So it can happen. Good leadership is what we need. We need people to be able to step forward instead of pushing us to the side we need leaders to bring us to the middle. Uh, I'm part of the new No Labels group because of that. I'm a blue dog because of that. Uh, we've got to be, get to a point where we begin to listen to one another, not preach to one another, but listen to one another. Uh, and again, I think our budget security, stability, and longevity are the number one issue for our country. And uh, I'm hoping your United States Congress, we get back over the next few weeks before Christmas, step up and deliver. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. That was great. For those of you who are just tuning in on OPB, I'm Sandra McDonough, and we're here with United States Representative Kurt Schrader from Oregon's 5th Congressional District and at the City Club Forum on Friday. So, 
You talked about what's going on out there in Washington, and I have to say from 3,000 miles away, looking at the headlines, it's hard to understand. What do your constituents say to you about the disarray in the House right now? Well, they're appalled, and they uh, should be. Uh, and again, as I, as I stated at the end there, uh, it's, it's a leadership uh, driven issue to a large degree uh, with redistricting, the primary systems we have, uh, the hardening, in my opinion, of uh, uh, folks moving to different places that agree with their opinion. Uh, we've got a hardening of uh, philosophies around the country. <laughs> so it's up to leadership to, to change that. And I, I will say this, I, one of the things I talk to a lot of my constituents about is that uh, again, there's a big appetite to do the right thing. The Homeland Security budget, member, we couldn't get that passed earlier this year. Uh, the right-wing Republicans were tying uh, uh, the president's immigration orders to that. It was one of those stop or I'll shoot myself type of moments for the Republicans to vote against Homeland Security. Uh, and Boehner reached out to Nancy Pelosi and, and we were able to pass it. Big bipartisan bill. And on the health care front, uh, it's not all about repeal Obamacare all the time. Uh, this committee I'm on, Energy and Commerce, uh, for the first time in 16 years with less partisan Congresses being unable to accomplish it, we passed a bill out that changed the reimbursement for doctors under Medicare that's value-based, that uh, our docs, our health professionals, our hospitals can compete very well with. And passed it out of our committee unanimously. 51 members, conservative, liberal, moderate, saying yes. And then a little problem with how to pay for that because it costs money to change that reimbursement system. Amazingly enough, again, Nancy and John uh, stepped up, came up with a way to pay for most all of that. And I think it's wonderful. Democrats learned you got to pay for stuff. It's not all free out there. And Republicans learned this stuff costs money. If you want to do good things, you gotta, you got to pay for things. you got to step up and put some money on the table. And that passed out of uh, uh, the House of Representatives 380 to, what, 35 or something like that. It was a huge, overwhelming vote on a very tough issue. Now, the news media doesn't talk about that. Most of you are pro probably don't even know what I'm talking about. But this is a big deal. If you're a senior and you want to have a doctor to take care of you, you're not going to be able to do that. It's a book of business trying to find doctors for people I didn't want to have. So stay tuned. So Obamacare continues to be an issue in this presidential election. Do you think we'll see changes in the next Congress to, that, to the bill? Well, we've tried uh, in, in the House of Representatives, we've put forward several different changes. Uh, they're all controversial. The sad part, Sandy, is that some people think that changing any of it means you're repudiating the Affordable Care Act, which is not the case. Uh, there are those folks that want to undermine it with some of the changes. They're always digging into the, or trying to dig into the prevention fund, which is probably the most cost-effective part of uh, the Affordable Care Act. But we're working on things like 40-hour uh, work week. I'd argue respectfully that uh, you know, one bill shouldn't change what has been historically a full, you know, the full work week for American businesses and workers, uh, trying to figure out a, a consistent definition for seasonal employee, uh, trying to figure out which small businesses should have to be held accountable to this. I mean, there are good things that we should fine-tune on this. I mean, any piece of legislation, any contract you write with your, your fellow business person, you know, you have to figure out, you know, have to fine-tune it. There's the unintended consequences or things that you leave to a future date to deal with, and I think you're going to see a lot of, hopefully, improvements to it as we go forward. There's a lot of huge national and international issues before Congress, and as a member and a leader in the Blue Dog Caucus, you are playing a key role in moderating and finding solutions. How do you balance your work on those with the bread and butter issues of the 5th District? Well, I'm, I listen to my constituents, I listen to my state. Uh, it is interesting, my takeaway, and you all can correct me, but my takeaway is these international issues dominate east of the Mississippi River. There are huge issues that motivate uh, voters, motivate constituents, that people are, feel passionately about. You go west Mississippi River, most people are worried about keeping the job, keeping the house, educating their kids, putting food on the table. It's pretty straightforward. And those are the issues I focus on, to be honest with you. And uh, I, I'd like to think I follow in the tradition of uh, a lot of great 
greater leaders than I uh, from Oregon, the, the Mark Hatfields and, and others, where you know I think less war is good. The biggest economic, biggest power in the, in the world isn't going to be the guy with the most battleships. It's going to be the guy with the bis, biggest pocketbook, the biggest economy. Uh, that's why I feel strongly about trade and some of these other issues. I think that's where the real competition is going forward. Uh, and I want America to be great. I, I think our best days are still ahead of us despite the dysfunction you're, you're seeing and that the media is focusing on. There are folks in Congress, as I alluded to, that want to work together to make our nation very, very competitive in the 21st century. We still have the best economy out there. China, as you've read, is, is in big trouble. Uh, I got a chance to go to China and there's a lot of building there that no one's occupying. Uh, Latin America is in a bit of trouble. Europe still struggling through a recession. They have this huge immigration problem that they have to deal with. We're still the best bet in town. We are still the best bet in town. And if we get it right over the next few years, I think we'll have a great future. Well, you mentioned trade, which is a huge issue right now and important for Oregon. We're one of the most trade-dependent states in the country. You supported the Trade Promotion Authority, which gave pres the president the ability to negotiate trade pacts. And now, soon, Congress is going to hear the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is an agreement among 12 Asia-facing um, countries um, on basically setting the rules for trade. So, first of all, what do you hear from your constituents? Trade is a controversial issue. What do you hear from them, and how do you talk to them about why trade is important to Oregon? Uh, I hear a lot of, about trade from my friends in the, uh, and brothers in the union movement. I hear a lot about trade from uh, forward-thinking business people. But again, to my point a moment ago, Joe Average, that's not their main thing. They're expecting me to take care of that. That's something that they don't want to have to focus on. I do feel that it's a great opportunity, however, for a lot of small businesses. We just had uh, the Small Business Administrator, uh, Maria Contreras-Sweet, come out uh, to talk to some of the small businesses in the Mid-Valley in particular about the opportunities. This is a global world. To me, it's pretty straightforward, Sandy. I mean, you don't have to be a cosmic you know, nuclear physicist to do this or win the Nobel Prize. It's pretty straightforward. The world is becoming a smaller place. It's a global economy. Whether you want it or not, it is a global economy. We're not the big dog anymore with what we do in the United States. The rising middle class in India, China, uh, frankly, soon to be in Malaysia, Vietnam. I think those are the areas where our businesses can sell to. I mean, again, when I went to China, people were dying for American-made goods because they trust American workers to do the right thing, to build quality materials. They trust American businesses because we have some of the most stringent building codes in the world, uh, environmental standards. So people want our stuff. And, and you get right down to it, uh, who's going to set the rules of engagement? Do we want countries like China that have no working conditions, that have no, virtually no environmental standards, I and mean, you can't even breathe in the evening in Shanghai? Do you want these guys to set the rules or do you want America to set the rules? To me, it's straightforward. Uh, I think that the Trade Promotion Authority was a no-brainer. Every president's had that authority since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It wasn't me coming up with some brilliant idea to save the world. We've always done that. Why would we not do that when our economic competitiveness is at stake? And so far on the TPP, uh, I, I've already talked to uh, U.S. trade rep guys and gals and trying to get a sense of how it affects my farming, business, worker, environmental communities. And it's an amazing improvement over what NAFTA, even the core the Korean uh, agreements were about. Uh, we'll see. Uh, the text should be available probably in another 20, 25 days. So we'll be able to all look at that in some detail. I've looked at text over you know, the last two years, but it's now all finalized, and we'll all have access to that. I hope to hear from folks. Oh, I guarantee I'll hear from folks. Uh, but it's good. That's good. Uh, different perspectives uh, going forward. And then you've got another 60 days to chew on that before the president can, uh, can do anything, and uh, we'll certainly be voting on it. I hope sooner rather than later, although some of the recent buzz is that because it might make the president look good, Mc McConnell and, and uh, House leadership might delay it till the next elections, which would be catastrophic. Every time we don't move forward, some other nation comes in as a most favored nation status. And any of you all that are in business, you know, the idea that once you lose a market, it is tough to get it back. We're struggling to get beef back into China after the, remember the BSE stuff, mad cow thing that we had a, few, a bunch of years back. 
we're still struggling to get that market back. So for those of you that aren't in business, it's not like you turn the switch on and off when you pass a piece of legislation. We want to do it as soon as possible. But a lot of people, when they think about trade, they think about the big multinational corporations. They don't understand it's blueberry farmers in yep. your district and potato farmers. Are, are you hearing from those guys and saying, open up these markets for oh, us? Yeah, I am. The, the ag industry is all over this. Uh, uh, there are small businessmen and women. We have very few mega farms here in, in Oregon. We do have some. But most of our guys, particularly in the Valley, they're all small family farms. Mine was a small family farm. I was selling uh, squash to Japan. You know, the blueberry, uh, uh, strawberry, the small fruits and vegetables come out with, uh, under this agreement like bandits. Zero tariffs by any of these countries. Zero tariffs. They face zero tariffs in the nations that are in this TPP. So they're all over this thing is a huge win. They want our fresh fruits and vegetables. And it's a sea change. You know, back when NAFTA and all these other things were occurring, you couldn't send that stuff overseas without it getting rotten. Due to modern transport, refrigeration techniques, whatever, heck, we're sending live crab over to these countries now. Just think of the opportunities for us on the Pacific Rim. We're the seventh biggest trading state in the United States. We punch way above our weight when it comes to trade. This is a huge opportunity if we get it right, and I think most of what I'm seeing so far looks pretty good. You have one of the most diverse districts in terms of geography probably in the country. You have part of Portland, go south to I-5, big parts of rural Clackamas County, and then a big chunk of the, the coast. What are the differences that you hear from your constituents? Are there urban and rural differences, or is it consistently the same things? Yeah, we have a very diverse district. I've been blessed since I came to state legislature with diverse districts. Even in Clackamas County, uh, when I was a state house guy, my district had uh, parts of Lake Oswego and parts of uh, rural farms up the, the mountain towards, uh, uh, towards government camp. Same thing in my Senate district, and of course this legislative district, I have some of the wealthiest people in Oregon and Lake Oswego in the district, and I've got some of the poorest out in Tillamook County that are struggling uh, to keep the roads going. It, uh, the biggest, I, I guess the biggest issue, interestingly enough, uh, in the seven years now that I've been in Congress and campaigned and visited with folks uh, around the district. The biggest issue I get from my folks in my district isn't on any given issue, Sandy. The biggest issue is work with the other side. I want you to figure a way to work out with the other team. And I, I, I start out, I used to start out saying, well, you know, I'm not in the majority. They, they cut me right off. I don't care. I elected you, Kurt. I want you to do everything you can to make sure you work with the other side. I want to get something done. I think that's a pretty reasonable request. And uh, so that's been my focus. You know. that's, that's pretty much what the blue dogs do, right? You're trying to find that. Why on earth are you called blue dogs? <laughs> Colorful. Uh, I guess it goes back to uh, the old days long before I was in Congress where uh, we had a, uh, well, and it's, it's a lesson for us as Democrats as we see the struggles the Republicans have with the Tea Party right now. Uh, uh, we had overwhelming majorities uh, in the late 80s and, and early 90s, prior to 1994, and thought, you know, our, our brand was solid and never going never gonna to wane. And Democratic leadership began pro pushing a, a more and more progressive agenda, which isn't bad. You know, I'm proud that Portland and Eugene are, are in my state. They make a, they're a conscience of our state, make us think a, a lot about what we've taken for granted or thought was normal. I think that's great. But if you push it to where everyone has to feel the same and vote the same, then you get in trouble. Then you're not listening anymore. And uh, so what happened was uh, uh, a lot of conservative Democrats at that time, mostly from the South, uh, felt like they're getting choked uh, by leadership on a regular basis, choke blue. And so they called themselves the blue dogs uh, from that point forward, that point forward. I've always wondered that. Um, immigration and race have been very big issues in this presidential campaign year, and they're front of mind for many Oregonians. We have rapidly changing demographics in this state, and we know that we're going to look very different in a decade. 
First of all, do you think we're ever going to see comprehensive immigration reform? Well, I do. I do. I, I won't give you a timeline for when that'll happen. Uh, after the last election, say what you will, it was pretty crystal clear uh, from the Republican National Committee's own internal audit and report that one of the big things they have to do to win the presidency is appeal to the Hispanics and other nationalities are moving to this country because they appear to be totally intransigent towards immigration. That was their verdict. What do they do? Well, I alluded to it already. Right out of the chute, the beginning of the 114th Congress, they moved to uh, impeach or, 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 you know, actually basically impeach the President of the United States because of his immigration orders and double down on being anti-immigrant. I mean, if there's a single Hispanic American that votes Republican, I'll be shocked, other than maybe Rubio, who's kind of a token Hispanic Republican anymore. I mean, it's a shocking to me. It's shocking to me. They've doubled down on this rhetoric, and they continue to do that uh, through this Congress. So while they do that, the, the business community uh, across the country, not, certainly here in Oregon, uh, is overwhelmingly in favor of comprehensive immigration reform. The labor community has come behind it. That's a tough nut for them to crack. They're, you know, that's legitimate worries, but they've come to the table on comprehensive immigration reform. Faith-based groups have done it. Work, farm worker communities have done it. Farmers have done it. I mean, uh, I'm blessed in a, uh, to come from a state where it seems like it's a pretty obvious no-brainer. The Senate has passed a comprehensive immigration bill last Congress, but the House refuses to take it up. There may be, uh, for those of you that pay attention to arcane, Byzantine, internal polit political maneuvers, uh, uh, on Friday, before I came home, last Friday, we successfully, for the first time since 2002 and one of the few times in American history, uh, were able to successfully file what we call a discharge petition for the Export-Import Bank. What does that mean? Normally, uh, the only way a bill gets to the floor of the House is if the Speaker says so, right? The Speaker has to allow a bill to get through a committee and or just come to the floor. He or she alone determines that. There is one exception a discharge petition. If you can get 218 members of a ho the House of Representatives, in other words, a majority, that's what a majority of the House is now, 218. If you can get 218 members to sign on a piece of paper, they want a bill to come to the floor, the Speaker cannot prohibit it. And we did that on Friday for the XM Bank. State it's very rare, wasn't it? Very rare, very rare. <laughs> Stay tuned, that might be a procedure you see used for other hot button tough issues that leadership has been afraid to bring to the floor but have the votes both on the Republican and Democrat side. So how about the issue we're seeing, the Black Lives Matter movement? What role does Congress play in helping our country move forward on these very difficult issues of race we're confronting? A lot of those are locally based, as you know. I think we need to do some serious soul searching about our, and we're doing, seeing this already in Portland, about how, how we effectively police. What is the relationship with, between law enforcement and the community? Uh, you know, people want the law enforcement there. They don't like some of the things that are going on in the community, but the law enforcement approach has to be a 21st century approach. Uh, and that's tough. That's very tough to do. Uh, at the federal level, I think we also need to be talking about stuff like voting rights, you know, and uh, ability to get to the election polls. I mean, there's been, in my opinion, a concerted effort to undermine people's ability to vote around the country. Oregon is a unique exception. We made it easier for people to vote. Now, we trust people. That's not been what's happened around the country. Uh, and so I think that we should be pushing that. And then, uh, you know, uh, affirmative actions under siege, too. Uh, Supreme Court, I'm very worried about where they're going in these areas. If we can show uh, minority communities, uh, uh, African-American communities that we care, I think that helps defuse a lot of that, and hopefully we'll become one nation again. Okay. Another easy issue, gun control. You know, sadly, Oregon was at the center of a discussion about guns with the very tragic shooting at Umpqua Community College. You have an incredibly diverse district, as we said. What are your constituents saying about that, and 
how do you see us moving forward on that issue and balance what the Constitution says about the right to bear arms with the need to keep guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them? Sure, sure. Uh, that's a extremely difficult issue. I dealt with that with Clackamas Town Center not too many years ago. Remember, we had the uh, active shooter situation there and people, people died. Uh, actually, I saw the president uh, on Thursday or Wednesday before he went to uh, uh, Douglas County. And I said, I told him, hey, be careful, Mr. President. Uh, if I were you, I would just make sure you deal with uh, the the suffering and pain that the families and the community are dealing with. Uh, I would not get out there in front of a whole lot of other things because this is Southern Oregon. This is Southern Oregon. And we've, we've read the news reports about what went on while he was there. Uh, you know, we need to make sure that guns, any weapon, frankly, can only get in the hands of those people that are, you know, frankly, sane enough and, and mentally able to deal with these things. Uh, Oregon stepped up and did uh, universal background checks. I'd like to see that sort of thing at the federal level. There's a movement on my health and uh, energy committee through the uh, uh, through my health subcommittee. Dr. Uh, Tim Murphy from Pennsylvania, a friend of mine, Republican, is a psychologist, and he's been putting uh, been pushing a, a suite of mental health bills for a long time. They've been languishing. I am hoping if anything good comes out of this horrific tragedy uh, at Umpqua Community College, that maybe this will give life to these bills, uh, both. As I mentioned before, that, this committee works pretty well. Fred Upton's a moderate Republican from Michigan. Frank Pallone, good Democrat from New Jersey. They usually try and focus on things that can bring us together. And I don't think, it, I can't think of many other things besides you know, smart mental health legislation to kind of empower things. Portland's leading the way. Your health providers, Legacy in particular, developing a new college, not college, a new hospital campus so the police officers won't be taking mental health patients to the jails or go to a campus where they can be taken care of. That's, that's like revolutionary. That's so huge and exciting. I hope this community and the rest of our state support that. But that's the type of stuff I hope that gets to the long-term answers. It's called the Unity Center. It's a great program. For those of you to just now tuning in to OPB, I'm Sandy McDonough and I'm talking to Congressman Kurt Schrader at the City Club Friday Forum. So we're now going to open up for Q&A portion of the program. If you have a question, you can write it on an index card and hold it up high and the City Club team will pick it up from you. We will take questions from the audience. As always, we invite members to the microphone to ask their questions. Asking questions at a Friday forum is a benefit of City Club members, and um, it's, op it's open to all members here. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. And I'll read at least one index card question as well. Sir, you're up. Hi, my name is uh, Justin Ward. I'm a Civic Associate with the City Club of Portland. Um, my question, so you mentioned uh, in the global economy, and you mentioned how where it's getting much, the world's getting much smaller. So in the global economy, education and specialization becomes uh, increasingly important um, for any nation. Specifically um, in our nation and in Oregon, we're seeing a growing crisis in our education standards. Um, in order to maintain our presence in the global economy, what hurdles on a federal or state level um, do we need to overcome in education? I think our education systems, system uh, is probably the biggest issue outside of the budget that our country faces. Uh, as you know, there are those in Congress uh, that would like to defund the Department of Education. I think that does nothing to improve the future for our kids and our grandkids or our economic competitiveness. Uh, I believe strongly that uh, instead of spending a bunch of this money overseas in intractable conflicts, uh, I'd rather have the Russians there spend all their damn money, frankly. Uh, bring our troops home, bring our money home. I'm disappointed with the President's most recent decision about leaving troops in Afghanistan. Uh, we know we're already leaving troops in Iraq. I think we need to be spending a bunch more money on education at the federal level. Uh, right now, less than 3% of your federal tax dollars go there. That's in stark contrast to your state legislature. I know they get beat up, but they step up and the neighborhood of 50% of their general fund dollars goes to support education. Uh, specifically, I also believe that uh, we have the, the, uh, the requirement to fund early childhood education. Again, Oregon has stepped up. Uh, I just visited Gladstone, a good friend of mine, Bob Stewart, superintendent there. They're doing an amazing 
uh, uh, program where they integrate the, the health, nutrition, and educational aspects of these early kids so they have a great shot at succeeding when they get into uh, elementary and secondary schools. Uh, one of the things I think is close to actually finish, crossing the finish line is the uh, 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 Elementary and Secondary Education Act, ESEA, the rewrite of No Child Left Behind. It has passed, one version passed the House that was not good, let's put it that way. Uh, a very good and robust version of ESA passed the Senate, awaiting action in the House. Again, wait and see what might actually happen uh, with this Congress. Even though it's a leaderless on the House side, there may be some options, but that's critical. And, uh, and, then, and then on the uh, higher education front, uh, I don't think you're going to get, I don't think free stuff is the way to go. Uh, I think that what we need to do is make it so it's affordable for kids to go to college. They should not graduate with these mountains of debt that are just horrific. I'm ashamed to be an adult in the United States of America when fellow veterinary students are graduating with $120,000, $160,000 in debt. And veterinarians, they're not docs, uh, human docs. They don't get that same reimbursement. It's astonishing and a travesty. We've got to find a way to partner, you know, frankly, with our, our educational institutions, private industry, and uh, come up with a plan to make that a lot more affordable. I did that when I was in the House, uh, excuse me, in the Senate here in uh, Oregon. I worked with Governor Kulingowski, and we had uh, the Opportunity Act where if you could work for a minimum wage during the summer and a little bit during the school year, you wouldn't graduate with this mountain of debt from undergrad. You maybe have a $25,000 debt. So we need to do all those things and have high standards, high standards that states agree with at the end of the day and hold our, our, uh, our children up to those standards and give them the opportunity. I'm one of these guys that believes if you uh, expect your kids to achieve a lot, they're going to achieve a lot. If you, on the other hand, set a low bar, then they're going to unfortunately reward you with low achievement. That's, that's uh, sweet music to my ears as a mother of a college grad who is still paying off her loans. So thank you. Um, so Congressman Schrader, you and I have met before. We're no strangers to each other. And um, in lieu of what you talked about with trade partners, building up trade partners, and the health of the country, um, one thing I'd like to uh, draw your attention to and um, I'm with a group that lobbies for uh, ending poverty uh, around the world and domestically. So um, in the last, uh, since 1990, uh, child deaths have been cut in half. The United Nations was proud to announce that one of the Millennium Goals was reached. By the year 2035, we want to eliminate all preventable child deaths and maternal deaths and child deaths under five. So my question is this. H.R. 3706, which calls for um, its grant money that's already been given to the USAID. What we want is greater oversight to make sure that what's measured is treasured and what's treasured is measured. That's not my quote. That's from the director of... of uh, so would you, and it's across the aisle, support, we got Republican and Democrat, would you please support and co-sponsor H.R. 3706? Sounds like something I'd really like to get behind. I would like, usually like to read things before I vote for them. Believe it or not, mo a lot of us do do that in Washington, D.C. But it sounds very good, Janet. It sounds like a great, great initiative. Congressman, I'll, I'll ask a question from our audience, one of the index cards. This is a good one. Do you believe there's a possibility for a coalition of moderate Democrats and moderate Republicans to choose a moderate Republican as a speaker or a moderate Democrat? Hmm, maybe. <laughs> Not sure I want to say a whole lot about that prospect. Uh... Uh, but seriously, there are obviously, uh, believe it or not, there are a lot of discussions going on throughout the United States Congress right now. Uh, while I'm back in Oregon and basking in our beautiful weather, beautiful, beautiful fall weather, uh, I and others making a ton of phone calls and seeing if, uh, if there is an opportunity for maybe thoughtful, moderate folks, and maybe not so moderate fo folks, but just people who want to solve problems to come together and be a counterweight to those that want to shut down our government and be obstructionist because they don't get their own way. So stay tuned. I'm Bill Harris, a City Club member. In your long discussion about budget, 
You included the statement, it's quite difficult in the Congress, among other difficulties, to get agreement regarding any source of additional revenue. I'm very much interested in our very clumsy response to climate change that's going on now. And it happens that a, coal ta a, uh, a carbon tax is a source of revenue, among other things. Other elements of the carbon tax will be argued about, but what is your prediction regarding our ability to have a carbon tax in the near future? Unfortunately, that's an easy question to answer, and uh, the answer is there, there is not an, um, any future for a carbon tax in the near term. Uh, the party that is in control of both the House and the Senate uh, does not even believe climate change exists, uh, much less are they inclined towards any sort of uh, uh, tax to help uh, support and ameliorate uh, the effects of carbon pollution in our, in our country and in our world. Uh, when I first came to Congress, Bill, I thought with the Energy Independent Security Act that we worked on in the House that that was actually a good blueprint for getting at that. It was more of a cap and trade rather than the carbon tax, but at least it got to the fact that uh, this country was going to recognize that it's an issue. Uh, unfortunately, got caught up in partisan politics, uh, was the, the beginning, frankly, of the end of any comedy uh, in the United States House of Representatives, uh, and we went downhill from there. Uh, I wish people would step up and realize, think, all you got to do is look at the wildfires all across the West, uh, the extreme cold we endured in Washington, D.C. Man, when I went to D.C., I thought I was going to the South. Man, it isn't cold there. I tell you, I was shocked. And of course, with climate change, it's colder yet. And what we're seeing is vast extremes. The disasters that the world faces are much more extreme now. Prior to the 1980s or whatever, our disaster budget usually covered the disasters our country faced on an annual basis. But after the 1980s, uh, as the climate heated up, as there were huge fluctuations, both cold and warm, uh, our oceans are acidifying right now. We've got a huge problem, not just off of our coast, but our coasts around the world. Some leading research is being done. Uh, believe it or not, in Tillamook County, OSU and some of the uh, sh uh, shellfish growers there are trying to figure ways to, to combat that. It's a big issue. We need to dr get after it. Unfortunately, it's going to have to wait a few years, at least for that particular solution, till there's a sea change uh, in the House of Representatives and the United States Senate. Hi, good afternoon, Cheryl Hodgson. I'm a City Club member. Um, I didn't study a couple of things in civics class or government in college about Congress, and I've always wanted to know this. A couple of questions procedurally, and wondering if you encounter this as a congressperson yourself. Some of the rules that just seem so mysterious that allow um, things to slow down, or so it seems from our standpoint, where they bury something in a bill that's unrelated and sneak, it feels like they sneak something through in a bill that's unrelated, or um, they hold up on a major bill because there's some pork barrel spending that gets snuck in or whatever. So I don't know, how do those rules, you were talking about the procedures of Congress, I'd just like to know a little bit lower about how some of that came about and is there any ability to bypass some of that? Uh, I'll confine my remarks to just the areas you're talking about because uh, I could wax eloquent about how undemocratic our democracy is after the elections. Uh, the rules you're referring to, uh, the House is a has more uh, germaneness to its uh, rules than the Senate does. Uh, under House rules, amendments have to be germane to the bill unless it's a spending bill. Because what happens then, uh, as you develop, you, you may be a, uh, uh, a bill on transit and you're dealing with transit, but then when you want to pass money to deal with that and afford your transit bill, that then you find monies from a variety of different areas not necessarily related to the transit bill, and then the germaneness gets thrown out the window. That's oftentimes how all of a sudden all these other things start to get thrown into the bills on the House side. Uh, the Senate has no rules. You know, there's not one president of the Senate. There are a hundred of them. And they're all convinced that they all walk on water and that they can do whatever the heck they want to do whenever they want to do it because they're United States senators, except for our guys, of course. <laughs> the rest of the bunch 
have an exalted opinion of themselves, and unfortunately, there really are no rules. There is no germaneness. You can offer amendments anytime you want on any subject, and that's just been customary. There's nothing in the Constitution that gives them authority to do that or allows them to do that or suggests they should do that. That is just customs. But as you know, our own uh, Senator Jeff Merkley has been leading some, some, for a charge for some changes on the filibuster side and some of the germaneness issues, and, and hopefully some of the newer blood that's coming is beginning to shake up the establishment on that and we'll get, get better situation where these rules of obstruction uh, won't be allowed, although rights of the minority will, and that's the fine line. We have run out of broadcast time for further questions and we'll have to stop for the day. Please join me in thanking Representative Kurt Schrader and Sandra McDonough for joining us today. Thank you also to Walter Robinson for producing our show today. Thank you, special thank you to the staff here at the Sentinel for working with us on our Friday Forum. Again, I'm Courtney Nelson, the president-elect for City Club. Please have a great weekend, and we will see you next week. We're adjourned. <laughs>